Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Hey, really? Yes. Okay, ish. You said. Okay, ish. Yes. Yeah, this ish thing has come in vogue just uh, what the last year, and I give it another six months, where people say it, ish. I think it's been in vogue longer than that. I'm. A, I guess I'm a late adopter. You're. You're on the West Coast. I'm on the West Coast. Uh, uh, yes. And things get to the West Coast early. But but well, but you're okay. You've seemed to me actually in uncharacteristically good spirits lately. Really? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Maybe I'm getting you mixed up. My with mother else. died. That's the main thing. Uh, yeah, that was a couple of months ago. Yeah, so that's meant a grim. Yeah. I'm of course sorry about that. Yeah, no, it's it's been grim though. Grim six months. So. Six anyway. six weeks. No, she was sick, so it was oh, 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 before that. Okay. So it's okay. been a. Long um, heart slog. Uh, she was a nice lady. She was. I mean, I only uh, actually met her once. We had lunch with your parents, and as you may recall, uh, my reaction afterwards was to say to you, if you had told me she was the Queen of England, yeah, I would have well, believed you. She was an Anglophile. Her gravestone says, I'd rather be in London. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so. she and she had this regal, commanding air. Um, if you say so. No, well, she did. Anyway, she was really smart, and she was a great mother, and... Everybody liked talking to her. She yeah. said what she thought. Yeah. Uh, so, um, that anyway, we're digging out of that. Okay. So, uh, aside from that, everything was fine. Uh, and you? <laughs> well, in some ways, that's actually a natural transition. Um, I, I am, I guess you might say, mixed emotions. There's, there's uh, good news and bad news um, on the blogging heads front. Yeah. Uh, there, there's. Uh, I actually don't know what your news is on the Blogging Hedge Fund. I just know that there is news. You have an inkling, but we have not. No, I have not kept you uh, uh, prized at a fine grain level. You have an inkling, uh, and I guess it would be, it would be unblogging heads esque to start with the good news because that's what everyone else would do, right? That, that's what a PR firm would advise you to do: start with the good news. So I'll start with the bad. News. I would start with the good news. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what. I will start with some good news on the personal level that is not unrelated, as we'll see, to the whole Blogging Heads video scene. The good okay. news for me on the personal level is that The Atlantic announced today um, that I'm going to be blogging for them come January, and I'll be a senior editor there. And I'm genuinely excited about that. Because, um, you know, breaking into the blogosphere uh, is not what it was ten years ago. When, when did you do it? Uh, I did it in 1999, Bob. Yeah. Geez, 12 years ago. And, and I think it's, it's harder to do now. And, I mean, with all due respect for your own accomplishment, <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, uh, it is harder to do now. And I really can't think of a better place to, to, to start off uh, than the Atlantic. I, I really... Um, the, the Atlantic's a good side as long as you get over their, this ridiculous idea they had that they should just talk to each other and people would enjoy watching... Atlantic writers debate Atlantic writers. I don't think that is so characteristic of it these days at all. No, I think it's changed. But it, it used to be more idea. Right. Yeah. right. I'm not sure it's bad. I think some crosstalk is is good, but but I don't think that's what it mainly is in any event. Well, no, but the I, but you should take on the world, not just Atlantic. Writers. But I do think the presence of other uh, prominent bloggers is one of the things that makes it uh, a good place to to show up. Um, I agree. Although once you ridiculed. The, their idea that they were going to quarter the market on bloggers. I think they've abandoned that, and they just have a bunch of good bloggers, which is fine. Wait, you said I ridiculed it? Or I think we both ridiculed it. We? Well, I don't remember, but let's don't dig up that videotape. I just thought I'd bring that up. <laughs> uh. I, don't, I don't, I mean, that's crazy. I don't think they ever had the idea they were going to corner the market on bloggers. Well, I think he had some idea, he had some idea along those lines, because that's how his, Bradley's uh, business conference business had worked. Look, work. I think, I'll tell you, I think in retrospect, what they did must have been brilliant. I mean, uh, you know, first they brought in, well, they brought in Andrew Sullivan, among other bloggers, and wound up having just a lot of traffic. Um, and in the meanwhile, uh, they figured out other things to do with that traffic. I mean, both the Atlantic site and the Atlantic Wire, which is a news aggregator, um, uh, with a slight, slight kind of twist, but basically an aggregator, um, are doing very well. I mean, they, 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 
I, I, in retrospect, you know, they figured, well, job one, get some traffic, then figure out what to do with it. Now they've done it, and they have kind of three things. They have the blogs, and they have then, then uh, those, those two other dimensions. They have a bunch of good people writing for them, and they are a classy outfit. And, Bob, David Bradley is the finest American I've ever known. <laughs> is that from the main Carrion uh, candidate? Yes, Lady I can Jane? see nothing wrong with him. He's <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful man. That's, you know, it took me a while to wise up to the wisdom of saying generally positive things about people who employ you. And I, but I now subscribe to that philosophy entirely. And, and I couldn't have said it better than you just said it. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, and also, you remember James Bennett from, from uh, New Republic yeah, days. Sure. And you, do you know Bob Cohn, who does the website? Um, he, he's, he's great. I don't think I know him that well. No. It's, it's great people there. They know what they're doing. Uh, so, I agree. I'm excited. Okay. I think that's great. Enough good news. Okay. Now, the blogging heads, um, some bad news, followed by some, I, what is at least from my point of view, good news. So anyway, um... The uh, blogging heads is about to go through a transition. I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly how to launch into this. Uh, you know, there's kind of, you could say, three kinds of blogging heads content in a way. You know, there's there's actual shows like the Weekend Blog is 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 maybe the only pure example of this. Okay, like regular thing done by kind of the same people. Um, there's stuff that I do, which is in in a in a, in a Slightly different category from the main, the main run of stuff. It, it's often more interviewy, and because it involves me, it's just easy for us to do. Okay, those two categories, shows and stuff involving me, are kind of relatively easy to do. You know, um, relatively cheap and easy to do. What's hard to do is what we mainly do, which you might call blogging heads classic, which is you know, different pair of people every day from there's somewhere in the world. Uh, they're on different technical platforms. They may or may not be, be especially, uh, you know, technophobic, um, whatever. Some of them are here for the first time. That is hard to do, harder than people realize, I think, to do that. And it's been mainly what we have done. You know, we've done a total of, I don't know, around nine dialogues a week and about seven probably fall in that latter category. Um, it became apparent fairly early on that there's no real obvious business model here. In, ter in terms of being able to generate enough revenue through like ads to to do to, to, to pay for that. Um, and so we've gotten by by being a kind of de facto 501c3, um, you know, a de facto nonprofit in the sense that we've gotten a, a fair amount of philanthropic funding. That's what's kept us afloat to the extent that anything has. In addition to like some loans from the initial investors, you know, the company started, Brainwave TV started back when there were high hopes for online ad revenue. Um, uh, but again, it's become kind of a de facto 501c3. It's very, it's very hard, though, to, to get funding um, when, you're, when you're not an actual nonprofit, as we have not been. Um, and we've, you know, kind of reached the, the end of our rope. I mean, I, I've kept it going for a while. Um, we don't have the resources on hand to keep doing that. Um, so one thing that's going to happen is we are actually going to become a 501c3. As of January 1st, the foundation I've started, um, the, the, the company Brainwave TV will dissolve, um, and the investors have been great about that because they by and large weren't in it for the money to begin with, and they're, they're happy. Uh, they're, they're just happy to see, the uh, I think, the site live on. Um, so the company's going to dissolve. Assets will be transferred to this foundation, and I hope then that that's going to allow us to, um, uh, to, you know, raise enough philanthropic funds to, um, to in the long run, uh, keep it going. But in the short run, um, the Blogging Heads Classic content uh, is going to to drop precipitously. So come January. You're not going to find, um, uh, you know, that kind of content on the site um, every day. You, you know, I hope we'll be able to get uh, one or two of those kinds of things up a week, uh, just to keep the flavor in the mix. Um, but uh, it's not going to be much of it. The weekend blog is going to stick around. I'm happy to say. Um, 
Uh, Bill Share is on just about every week, along with um, either Matt Lewis or Kristen Soltis. Your your buddy at uh, your buddy at the Daily Caller, Matt Lewis. Um, cool. The uh, but but aside from that, the void is going to be filled by that third category of content that's relatively cheap and easy, which is uh, content involving me. Okay, I'm going to be doing more. Um, it's like the Oprah Network with Bob. What's that? It's like the Oprah Network, except it's the Bob Wright Network. <laughs> um, of necessity, for a while, it will tend to seem like that, perhaps. Um, you know, uh, I uh, and and here we we segue into um, what, for me at least, is some good news. Back into some some good news. Uh, I could dwell endlessly on on the bad news, which has a lot of dimensions that have been. Uh, you know, kind of not pleasant to contemplate, um, uh, you know, including the way it affects the, the staff we have here and um, and lots of other things. But uh, but I'm I'm happy to say that um, I, well, first of all, I, I, I'm I'm kind of excited by the opportunity to um, to do more things on video that will tend to be shorter. Um, and and of kind of a great variety. I'm also very happy that, uh, that, that you know we, we will have uh, first of all a regular distribution outlet in Slate. Um, this is going to be a feature on Slate. I mean, my thing will be have some brand of its own, like the Right Show. I have not thought of anything more creative than that yet. Um, and, and it will appear clips uh, clips that I choose will appear um, on Slate under that kind of brand, um, and that is uh, great, because the, the Slate homepage is, is just a great place to show I, up. I think we should tell people that we are going to have a regular dialogue after this announcement. That, that you and I, this is not our last one, you mean? No, I mean, that later on, like, as, when you're finished oh, yeah, with this announcement, oh, yeah, we're going to oh, yeah, have a regular oh, yeah. argument. Well, they'll see the topic titles. Okay. That, uh, okay. that, that, that um, yeah. Okay. Uh, are, is that your way of telling me, Mickey, that maybe I should <laughs> wrap it up? No, we um, it, it's, let me, you let me should just, wrap it up, but but I just right, I was worried no, that we hadn't yeah. given people enough. Now they'll see they'll okay. see five other other okay. topic titles. Okay. Um, Sorry. So there's that, and of course you know um, I mean I uh, I can embed the video in the blog at the Atlantic as well, and sometimes it'll be organically connected to the blog at the at the Atlantic because if I'm in an argument with somebody in writing, you know I can say do you want to take this to video? I, I mean I guess I guess I'll have a kind of standing offer to anyone I criticize, you know. To, to, to argue with them in, on video, but anyway, um, so you know, I, I I just feel kind of lucky to have um, outlets for the video in addition to to the website um, here, uh, and but and and you know, I do uh, as for the blogging heads classic. I think uh, you know, there's I, I think we're not you know, in as bad a shape as, say, the British were at Dunkirk, and they wound up prevailing, you know. So I, I think there's a real chance of um, regrouping and um, and having more and more non-me content on blogging heads. Uh, there's various ways it could go, and, 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 well, it, and but anyway. Well, the, the thing I'm surprised by is you would think the technology of video would be getting cheaper and cheaper. And more and it more is. prevalent. Why yeah. haven't there been hundreds of blogging heads imitators that well, cropped up naturally? <clears throat> is is the software that you came up with that hard? I think to I think I was the uh, guinea pig or the canary in the coal mine or whatever. Um, I, I think you know, and that's the thing. I mean, I would the the fact that we're going to have to pause and regroup. I would feel worse about if there were somebody out there like making this work. You know, um, but I I think. I, I can tell you, first of all, that the economics, I mean, as you know, web journalism in general, the economics are just not compelling. Well, you need huge numbers. You need huge numbers. And so if you ask why is someone, you know, and the niche we're in <clears throat> is a pretty, you know, nerdy or highbrow, however you want to put it, niche. It's not, this is not, you know, Fox News. And um, so it's not surprising that it's hard to make the economics work. But the other thing is... We've tried to do something more than have reasonably cerebral video discussions. Um, we've tried to have uh, to kind of cover the ideological map and often have left talking to right and so on. 
Well, that's obviously not what happens naturally on the web. What happens naturally on the web is, you know, preaching to the choir sites. Those are the sites that find it easiest to amass traffic where you just sit around and tell each other how stupid the people on the outside well, are. Well, it's happening on, 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 in all medium. It's happening in TV, too. Right. So, you, so, that's, so we're swimming TV. against the tide in that sense. And right. That's the whole point. Right. And that is the whole point, but that's also why it, it naturally should be a nonprofit. You know, if there were a business model in an ideologically diverse site of, of serious you know, debate and discussion, that's what you would see a lot of on the web, both in print and in video, you know, but you don't. Uh, um, that's true. So, so you have a double handicap. I, I, I have more than two. I have more than two <laughs> handicaps. Um, no, video is just like never going to get as many hits as... as, as well, a kind of video is, but, it, but it's, not, it's not this kind of... I mean, that's the other thing. Video is an inefficient medium. You know, video that contains really... Yeah. Substantive information is an inefficient medium to access. On the other hand, well, look, I, I don't want to go on about this. Okay. <laughs> you tell me when to shut up. But, um, but it does, just doesn't seem that bad, except well, that you made it's the bad. Of look, it's bad uh, because I I, uh, it, I I had a, a, a staff of five, and that surprises people. But I'm telling you, you know, we had a lot of stuff. To do. Um, were they full-time? Full well, you to, ver to varying degrees, I would say they were full-time. It's a virtual company, and they work in their homes, and they don't have, you know... You made, you made the, the crucial mistake of hiring good people. They are good people. Never do that. They are good people. You've had contact with yes, a number of them. they're all competent. That means you have to pay them. And they're I also good even, people. I think you even complied with the law. There's that problem, too. <laughs> it was like, how stupid were you? Jesus. Uh, I made almost every mistake in the book. Um, uh, okay. Um, so anyway. And anyways, uh, I. Uh, uh, no, that's bad, and and it it means that there'll be less of the Lowry McWhorter type things, and the right ca and the you know well, the things you know, we do. Than, I, I do want to I do want to keep the platform open to people you know to our cherished contributors who want to be a little more proactive about initiating this stuff, you know, do some of the things that we used to do. Um, you know, when content just shows up, that's half the battle. Yeah. So I do want to talk to people about that. I will be talking to them about it. And that's one way I hope to keep the site in the near term during the Dunkirk regrouping. Okay. Um, keep it populated with content. Um, uh, so. How about higher production values in reality show like scripts? I with, think you've got something there. With stage fights and nudity. There's a lot of stuff we could do that we haven't <laughs> done, but okay. I think not all of it is well suited to the world of nonprofits. <laughs> okay. Um, um, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, I'll the, be, one way or another, I'll be answering viewers' questions the, about this. The Kardashians uh, have a naked yoga scene. Uh, that's the kind of thing you would know and I would. You could try that. Okay. Um... But then again, you were saying ish months before I was. Um, you always know well, things first. I, I, this doesn't sound that depressing. I was expecting worse. So, well, we'll see. I mean, if it, if, if we don't successfully regroup, it will be, you know, the demise of something amazing. E even right. if even if blogging heads lives on, you know, even if uh, you know whatever, as you know, w with my right. stuff and whatever. Right. If, if, if other content populates it, still the blogging heads classic is a very special species that I want to I want to keep alive, and I'm proud of. I agree. Um, the the but the news so there'll be, there'll be less stuff on the New York Times or no stuff on the New York Times. Yeah, that I mean we won't have stuff to send them, and we don't have uh, in the shortest term the resources to in a way send it. I mean that's a good example of something that takes more. Work than people realize. Picking out the clips, we did all the billing, you know. Right, right, right. That's also why I'm really grateful to have the the slate thing um, and and the Atlantic thing, uh, which, in some ways, uh, I don't want to get too much into the weeds, weeds, but they will have the they will use the blogging heads embedded player, whereas the New York Times used its own player. There uh, there are things that are that are that are better about that is about the embedded player, okay. and 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 that is weedy. 
That is what? Weedsy. That's Weedsy. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been living with this man for a long okay. time. I, I, no. This is this is like, like a confession for me. Well, nothing good lasts forever, and but maybe this will last for a while longer. And I think knows? in some form it will. It's a quite, and, and the main thing is that whatever it evolves into, it not be something you're ashamed of. I mean, a lot of, you know, sites live for a long time, but pretty soon they are so untrue to their original mission that it's like, what is the point? Well, Bob, that's why you'll never make it in this town. <laughs> you, have, you have shame. Uh, well... So I'm sorry that I've eaten up so much time, Mickey. This will still only constitute one yeah. topic. So, anyway, that's fine. Occupy Walls, it, uh, wait, quickly. I, I may, like, I've done a couple of, like, dialogues with individual commenters or sometimes with a, a staffer that's right. just kind of four commenters. I'll be doing something like that to address questions that show up in the yeah. comment section. Okay. Stuff about where we're going. Um, Occupy Wall Street, Mickey. Well, uh, it's, you know, Democrats are claiming... Or, or the, the sort of people on the left are claiming that Occupy Wall Street has successfully injected the uh, issue of income inequality into the public dialogue. And it's a little bogus because basically, you know, you had a lot of reporters who think income inequality is a, a problem. So uh, when Occupy Wall Street comes around, they're all primed to write their five part series on income inequality, and they do that. So you can't point to, you can't say, well, Occupy the Wall Street's a success because it generated all these articles. Well, the, the articles, you know, were not, it's not like they convinced these reporters that income inequality was an issue. They, the, they, they, the reporters are of like mind. But it does mean there's a lot of talk about income inequality, and income inequality is certainly real. Uh, so I do think it's, it's sort of been a success in that sense. Uh, Chuck Schumer is claiming that this is going to be the Democrats' <laughs> big issue. Uh, going into the election, that uh, polls show that the public cares about income inequality. They're not very convincing polls. There are polls commissioned for Chuck Schumer that show that 55 percent of the people think that income inequality is an issue. Well, uh, that's not very powerful evidence. It would be powerful if they said income inequality is a bigger issue than the environment or than the economy or than you know schools or something. Mickey, shouldn't Please. you do a full disclosure here? What, that I'm rich? <laughs> <laughs> disclose the fact that you devoted much of your career, certainly, you know, uh, beginning uh, with your book, The End of Equality, or certainly you'd certainly started doing this by the time that came out, to convincing people that income inequality is not an issue they should focus on. In and, and I think your position is, look, it's going to grow. Income inequality is going to grow. What matters is not income inequality, but social equality. Yeah, well, as long as the rich people smile at the poor people as they pass them yeah, on the streets right. and that's pat right. them on the head. As long as you sit on the same park bench, it's, everything's fine. Right. The, um, uh, that's, uh, that's basically my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, income inequality has been growing since around 1973. That's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. uh, the left was on the story before the right, but it, it, uh, they were right about that. Uh, uh, I don't think there's very much you can do about it. Uh, I do think if we think about it, what, what bothers us about income inequality is not so much that rich people have Porsches and poor people drive, uh, you know, for, you know, use Fords. It's that rich people, it's the social equality issue that rich people sort of seem to think they're superior, uh, mm -hmm. or they tend to, they, they, they can tend to, uh, they, 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 they can, uh, live in a separate world apart from the common life. Uh, As they in fact and, tend and to American, do. American common life tends to be egalitarian. That's mm -hmm. the joy of America. Mm -hmm. So we want people to participate in this common life as equals. Mm -hmm. I think America's pretty resilient in that it can withstand a whole lot of income inequality and still preserve its trademark social equality. Uh, it, it's being tested as, as the rich get richer. Uh, I do think it's perfectly valid to talk about class segregation and have all these New York Times stories about how the rich are walling themselves off. I, I still think it's not as bad as as, as the New York Times says, and, and the mere fact of growing income inequality doesn't bother me that much. So I'm not upset when the Gini coefficient goes up 0.3 percent. I am upset when rich Wall Streeters think they should jump the queue in bars because they're rich and they can bribe the doorman. Uh, that's sort of a statement of social inequality that's 
patently offensive. Uh, and I'm upset that people go to different schools and, and go to different institutions and that uh, the public parks become degraded and that there's skyboxes in the ballpark. All those are manifestations of social inequality. So that's basically my, you know, that's what I think. Uh, yeah, but do you, do you see any evidence that these things that you, the, 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 the manifestations of social inequality that you disapprove of are going to abate? Do you see any evidence that those don't actually tend to increase as income inequality tends to increase? Well, I think they do. I think people, rich people, ma manage more and more to avoid, you know, the demographic segregation is a truer and truer thing, not just by income, but by ideology. Well, there's know? sort of two phenomena. There's, there, there, there are two ways that income inequality is growing. One is uh, the income inequality I wrote about in my book, which is that the whole spectrum is being pulled apart mm -hmm. uh, like a piece of, uh, I don't know, dough uh, or an elastic rubber band. And the main drivers of that are uh, technology and trade, the increasing return to skills, the decreasing return to unskilled labor, uh, and also the emergence of, uh, you know, winner-take-all economies where uh, the superstars, you know, all reporters used to be paid about the same. Now the superstars make $400,000 and the you know, and the who, who, are, who are they? <laughs> I, I want to meet them. Yeah, Harry Kurtz. Oh, your friend Harry Kurtz. My friend Harry Kurtz. Uh, and, you know, Chris Matthews and Lawrence O'Donnell, they all make a fortune. And, so they're and, the, the, the TV personalities, yeah. Okay. Well, TV helps a lot, but I think they, the Washington Post had to pay Dan Balls a chunk of change to get him to stay at the Washington Post. I mean, there are superstars who are just mainly print guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Ariana's bidding up. The, so if you're a star, you make a lot of money. If you, that, That's happened in every profession. It's the, there's, there's income inequality within professions. Mm -hmm. So within doctors and lawyers, it's not just the super rich. It's just the whole distribution is being pulled apart, even right. in the middle. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's this second phenomenon, which uh, the sort of the scholarship one came after I wrote my book, which is that, that a lot of income at the very top is soaring. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I tend not to think that the income at the very top is not that horrible for social equality because there are only so many Warren Buffetts in the world. Uh, by definition, the very top of the period is very pyramid is a very small number of people. So if Bill Gates and Warren Buffett make a whole lot of money, that doesn't really, and they wall themselves off in a compound, which they don't really do. Uh, that doesn't really impact on the. <coughs> quality of life for everybody well, else. No, and if the sense, middle is pulled apart, that, you know, at the top 20%, right. uh, that does impact. But that is happening, and is I'm, it not? But I'm not sure that, the top, that that part has gotten worse, because we're in a horrible recession, and those people have taken a huge hit. So, yes, yes, the really rich are still getting rich, but the top mm -hmm. 20%, I don't think, are gaining. And I think once the more recent income mm -hmm. data comes out, you know, most of the studies you see end in 2008, once the income data from 2000, 2010 comes out, I think you're, 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 you're going to see the, the, the economic trend underneath it. For the top 20%, they didn't really get that much richer. They, they took a huge hit. They're the ones that own the homes and the stocks. This all sounds pretty conjectural. It um, is conjectural, but it's, you know, that's... The, it, worrying about income inequality is a whole lot more conjectural than it seems. It's not a question of just looking at the hard data. Yeah, but of course now, in addition to, you know, that, that's there's an income inequality, there's an aspect of income inequality that goes beyond the social inequality issue, which is out and out kind of unemployment and poverty, you know, and unemployment is kind of high now. That's that, not an inequality issue at all. That's that's the growth issue. Well, okay, but part of what Occupy Wall Street is about is that. And, 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 well, and, everybody gets behind that. Everybody's for economic growth. That's well, no, but, there, but, but, but the relationship between the two is this. There is enough affluence in this country, including extreme affluence, that, you know, you could tax people more and use it to give tax breaks to people with, with at the lower end of the income spectrum or increase the earned income tax credit or whatever and extend unemployment insurance more. You could do more of that. And and one thing the occupiers would like to see is that we do more of that. Okay. You know that we For, that we draw on the resources at the very top okay. of the income spectrum, two, the top one, two, three percent, and two, and use it to alleviate these problems that that are not two, strictly speaking part of income inequality, two, but are more about absolute income problems. 
Uh, two points. One, Ch you know, Chuck Schumer's argument is people care more about the top, about 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 income inequality when economic growth is stalled. When everybody's moving ahead, they don't care that much if the people at the top are moving uh, much faster. Okay, we so, care now. So, right. So the idea is that we haven't achieved economic growth, so that that's good for the Democrats because then people really resent the rich. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's something wrong with that argument, okay? The Democrats should be all about achieving economic growth and not benefit from uh, the failure of economic growth and, and the way that breeds resentment of the rich. So I still, I, you know, I thought I thought that this whole democratic idea was whistling past the graveyard. People are going to care about. Well, I think growth. if you can put so, resentment of the rich to the productive use of making the income tax more okay. progressive Fine. and use it well and use the, the resulting revenue well, I think. You might, you know, I mean, resentment is a certain is a political resource. Right. You know? Point number two: you're never going to use the tax code to redistribute income in a way that counteracts the core economic forces driving incomes toward toward a, a more bipolar and you know pulling them apart. Yeah. Uh, you know, even Fareed, you know, Fareed Zakaria wrote an art, an article, a column in Time, where he basically said, "Okay, you know, we'd have to, we'd have to have income." Income tax rates, you know, a top effective rate of 50, 60 percent. They don't even have that in Sweden, and in Sweden they're going in the other direction. Mm -hmm. That was the same situation when I wrote my book. You can't, and, it, and it's a standard left argument, and it's right. You cannot correct for the income distribution of capitalism through the tax code mm -hmm. in any effective way. The only way to really correct the income distribution, if you wanted to, is to stop people from earning the money in the first place. And we're not going to do that, so I say... Don't worry so much about income inequality. Worry about creating the core institutions that are going to let us have social equality despite growing income. Well, inequality. I would that's, say also create also create the mechanisms that will, uh, you know, uh, fight unemployment and and and, well, and increase people's but, skill yeah, level and so on. Yeah, and you need revenue for that. for that. You can get the revenue at the upper end of the income scale. Everybody's but, that. The problem is there are toxic effects to almost all the remedies. Well, first. So we've given up on changing Look, income me, equality. We're me, talking about let me, now talking about economic growth, and they also talk about mobility as a way to get around they, the fact that they can't do anything about income inequality. Let me tell you what uh, an idea that I had for if I were running Occupy Wall Street, and of course the essence of it is that no one's running it; it's horizontal, it's flat, you know. But anyway, um, this is a little related to what we're talking about. Tell me if this is a crazy idea. I mean, first of all, I am among those who think that this movement really does need to get some goals and a little bit of structure. Well, otherwise it's just going to vanish. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I, I thought it had an opportunity. Back when, right when Herman Cain was getting all that publicity for 999, if somebody had said the Occupy goal is like something like 333, okay, it would be something like for income under 50%, you cut taxes by 3%. Income over 250,000, you increase taxes by 3%. And then as for what the other three would be, it could be either a three-month increase in unemployment insurance or another 3% tacked on to the income over 500,000, whatever. You justify this slogan, 333, three, three, and you make it something like this that most Americans would say, fine, yeah, hey, that, that sounds fine. I don't have an objection to that. And that would be consistent with the values of all the occupiers, right? And if you could have gotten all the Occupy pyres all over the country just chanting three, 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 no. I mean seriously, <laughs> that that would uh, that would you know, I'd, something might have actually. It sounds happened. like a gimmick, but the Democrats are proposing this week. They're coming. They're saying, let's let's uh, cut the payroll tax even more and fund it with a surcharge on people who make over a million dollars a year. Right. Uh, so they're they're doing something like what you want in that. I, you know, I might even. I might even sign on to something like that because you're you're using the money to promote economic growth. You're not just redistributing. Uh, right now, so they, they, the the problem with high income tax rates it, it is not that they redistribute money from the rich. It's that they encourage tax unproductive tax shelters. So if you have a fifty percent rate, instead of investing in plants that yeah, well, that make things, rich <laughs> people are going to look for ways to shelter their income so and create gimmicks. And let them get around that 50% rate. It's a, it's a dead weight loss for society, and low rates are a, are a good thing. That's one of the lessons of the past 20 years. So the left should not be for raising 
income tax rate except as an absolute last resort in order to raise revenue. Well, we're both probably in favor of, of ending the tax shelters of real tax reform, but I would say that those aside, if you do a, a rev, something revenue neutral, if you reduce taxes at the low end of the income spectrum and increase them commensurately at the upper end in a way that's on balance revenue neutral, right now in the short term, that has a net uh, stimulative effect, uh, at least slight, because people at the lower end of the spectrum are more likely to use the, the money they get through a tax break for consumption. Um, okay, well, I'm, I'm all for that, if, especially if you don't do it by raising rates. Well, that's, that's, you would raise them somewhere and lower them elsewhere. That's well, what I'm saying. We don't want to raise rates because it encourages shelters, Bob. It's a bad thing. Well, you know, it's also true that people at the bottom of the income distribution don't pay much in taxes, and you know, the only tax they pay is the it, it, social it's, security it's not tax, like, and that's it's, the one we're cutting. It's not like all of a tax increase at the upper end of the spectrum gets swallowed up in, in by by tax shelters. No, but you don't want to encourage any waste. You don't want to, we don't want more smart well, people becoming lawyers. Well, and, well, and that the neighbors. logical the reductio ad absurdum of that logic is there shouldn't be any taxes on rich people at all. Because you're against, it sounds like you're against any tax that that might that, that that might encourage somebody to use a tax shelter. So then, rich people just shouldn't be taxed, right? According to you, you have to tax something in order to raise money to fund yeah, the okay. government. Bob, obviously. Thank you. I and think I'm for progressive taxes, I just don't think. But but the left does not understand the damage caused by raising rates as opposed to raising revenue by other means. What other means? Closing loopholes. Okay. Even yeah. Flat, fine. Uh, you know, I. It, Fine, but the Republicans it, it doesn't give you... bother me. It, it doesn't bother me if we have regressive taxes. I, the reason I like the payroll tax Fine. cut idea is that it's stimulative. It's not Fine, but it's when Obama does something that unambitious, like let's end some tax shelters, the Republicans are, no, we're against revenue. We're against government revenue. You know, the Republicans are pretty receptive and to taxes. And I would say, well, well the, look, wait a second. I mean, they have to be dragged kicking and screaming, and even I mean, the position of a lot of them has been no new revenue. You know, the, including the ending of tax shelters, and, well, and 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 the virtue of Occupy is I, I I do think it may have called attention the Democrats' attention to the fact that in times like this, you know, populist rage is there to be harnessed. I I don't think that Occupy Wall Street evinced much populist rage. It was all very small. I do think it in, it injected this. That it started mm -hmm. a lot of talk in the media that that pointed out to people, you know, the way inequality mm -hmm. has increased. I don't think that well, message had necessarily gotten through, and so yeah. if they, I don't. I don't. I think. I think you're people right. People are pissed off because they're unemployed and the economy is in the tank, and not not because they. I mean, that's the main well, reason. I, I why think you're yeah, right. I, I think the failure of the occupiers to grab onto some simple mainstream pr proposal for a more progressive tax yeah. rate the, kept the, them from becoming something big. But anyway, anyway the, the Democrats are in a better groove than they were two months ago when Obama was doing the, having these ridiculous tantrums, staging a sort of fake presidency, ordering Congress to do things that it was never going to do and being completely irrelevant. Now okay. he's faded into the woodwork and uh, and is letting the Democrats, you know, propose these appealing populist reforms mm -hmm. and then the Republicans vote down and and that's a better a better deal for them. Okay, uh, so maybe that's a anyway, segue. I, 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 I've been I've been sort of I haven't jumped into this debate just because I haven't gotten it together, but it does seem to me that nothing has changed since I wrote my book. Uh, the rich are getting richer, and the way, and there's no hope of stopping the basic economic forces to stop inequality from getting worse. And we have to build rebuild institutions like the classic one being the draft to treat people equally no matter how extreme income inequality is. Uh, and the schools would be another one. Well, the virtue of the draft is there to keep us out of stupid wars. Yeah, well, that, the draft isn't coming back, unfortunately. I was hoping the health care system, a, a nice, all-inclusive, universal health care system that treated rich and poor alike, uh, would, would sort of have the same socially equalizing function as okay. the draft. And I don't quite know. I, my impression is we're heading toward a stratified health care system, too. Uh, but the virtue of single payer was that it would get around that. Medicare is relatively egalitarian, for example. Yes. So, I uh, like Medicare, and I'm distressed that the Democrats seem to be abandoning Medicare. The Democrats? 
Yeah, the Democrats have agreed agreed in principle to have a uh, a premium support system instead of Medicare's guaranteed payment. So they behind closed doors before the super committee failed. This is the big stunning news that Robert Peer revealed last week. Mm. The Democrats were ready to go along with a Ryan Plan type deal uh, if only the Republicans had increased tax rates on the rich. So the, the Democrats are so crazy about increasing tax rates on the rich in a futile attempt to address income equality that they're ready to abandon Medicare. I'll it's have to take your word on that. It's crazy. Should we should we change the subject to a, a closely related thing? You wanted to talk about this idea that the uh, there's a new Obama coalition, or 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 as I understand it, I mean, you called my attention to this 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 thing in the uh, in the New York Times. Well, there's Tom Edsel, who's a very good political reporter, uh, pointed out what's sort of been obvious, which is that the. Obama's re-election strategy sort of gives up on the idea that he's going to get any particular support from the white working class. Now, mm -hmm. uh, Dave Weigel of Slate pointed out that well, they have all they're doing is they're saying that these people whose votes we haven't gotten in the last few elections, uh, maybe the last 20 elections, we're not going to get. Uh, well, that's true, but the uh, you know if you look at a state like Pennsylvania, it, it looks to me like they're assuming they're going to give, get even less of the white working class uh, than before. That's By white working class, I mean white, uh, white people who do not have a, a post-high school education, college education. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and instead, the Democrats are looking to, to, to build on what Roy Tejera calls the coalition of the ascendant, which is uh, Latinos, low-income Groups like not mm -hmm. not just working class groups, but people who really have very mm -hmm. low incomes, especially minorities, uh, educated whites, environmental groups, uh, single women, affluent right. suburbanites, right. and, ha and 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 the virtue of that is that those groups are growing demographically, whereas the white working class is shrinking. Okay. Uh, so so wait, what I don't understand is, I mean, what's new about this? I mean, the, the, that coalition you described is what you would kind of. Have fairly long expected for Democrats, except without the, the white working class. And they didn't they lose that during the Reagan era anyway? I mean, well, they lost some of it, but they got some of it back sometimes. And if you remember the last election, Joe Biden was running around Pennsylvania to the white working class community saying, "Oh, this Obama guy is okay," and that was one of the keys to winning the election. Was was that they? So, so now the Democrats they, are formally. You, you, the but, argument, I mean, Edsel's argument, is that the Democrats are more or less officially giving up on that. Right. You know, these these voters were part of the New Deal coalition, mm -hmm. uh, and now they're not. And the Democrats still claim that unions are part of their coalition. Mm -hmm. And who do unions represent? And not these guys. So, so they're sort of they're accepting the fact that unions only represent nine percent of the private sector workforce, uh, so, and that they don't represent white working class people. And it has actual policy implications. Uh, well, that's my question. What are the policy? Is it mainly in well, the realm of social issues, or I what? I can give you two of them. One, okay. This pipeline that Obama is dithering on. What pipeline? The tar, there's a Keystone pipeline that's supposed to go from the tar sands of Canada, bring the, bring the oil down to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, oh, so it, that would be good for the white working class, but environmentalists don't like it, so yeah. he's against it. Yeah, and, and so and he's against it, and and, uh, and and all sorts of inhibitions on energy drilling. You know, the ener energy sector is one of the few booming sectors. North Dakota is booming. Working class yeah, people but are I mean, actually getting jobs. But in this North goes Dakota. way back, and it's always, when you think about it, probably come at some kind of cost to the white working class. And the other thing about it well, is, but, it comes, de it, but Demo I think Democrats have always been much more ambivalent. Yeah, now yeah, Obama but, is siding much more with. Uh, but the other thing, Mickey, is, is a lot of these things come come also at the cost of the Hispanic and Black working class, right? So I don't, I don't see this being really a clean matter in policy terms. This this real. Well, it's this, as clean as anything. He's. Siding with the environment over jobs, and he's making it up to Latinos by siding, by pretending that he's going to get uh, an immigration amnesty and by instituting a de facto amnesty uh, through prosecutorial discretion, where in fact people aren't deported. Okay, so, so immigration that's, is that's, your... that's issue number two. Yeah. Uh, you know, in mm -hmm. Alabama, when they had this uh, this uh, pro enforcement immigration law, unemployment went down because immigrants who had been taking jobs left the state. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a jobs issue for a lot of unskilled American workers that, that they're losing their jobs to these better workers uh, 
from uh, who are un, who are undocumented. We'll get to that later. Uh, so, you know, th that's the second issue in where he's he's siding with his coalition against, uh, you know, against the interests of, of the white working class. It does seem to me bizarre that the Republican coalition would be based on the white working class. I mean, what's a what's a Republican party? It's just as much a burden. You know, this is the other half of the story. It's bad for the Democrats; they don't have these people. But it's also bad for the Republicans that they do have these people, because there's going to be a limit to the extent to which they can sell white working class people tax cuts for the rich forever and ever and ever. You would think. Uh, you would think. So, so what's, think what's, what's the, the matter with Kansas? Article, sorry. What's the matter with Kansas? Well, yeah, but Edsel's the Edsel's article sort of left out the second half, which is, is a problem for Republicans. The what's the matter Kansas point is very interesting because it keys on social equality. The whole point of what's the matter with Kansas, as I understand it, is the, the, the key shift has been the Republicans convincing the white working class that the Democrats were a bunch of snobs. Right. Uh, and what snobbery is social inequality. Uh, if if uh, the Democrats forthrightly somehow became the party of social equality, that would blunt and, 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 yeah, what's, and what's an example of how they what's, what's an example of how they would do that? Supporting the pipeline, supporting jobs for Americans. Oh, that, that's over, the party over... of social equality. I mean, no, that's an economic. You're back to economics. W w w reviving public schools as a as a place where upper middle class affluent suburbanites can send their kids would be the one of the biggest things we could. Uh, we could do for social equality, making sure that we that, that the healthcare system does well, no, not, not does not devolve into a stratified system where the rich people not only are richer but they live longer and get treatments that poor people don't get, uh, which we sort of resisted. Uh, make make resisting that, uh, you know, a, a major effort. That, and, and and that would be popular, and that mm -hmm. happens. People, you know, Medicare decides, oh, we're not going to treat something, and there's a hue and cry, and Medicare reinstates it. Uh, Democrats should be for provided for providing everybody expensive treatments that otherwise only rich people could get. Yeah, uh, and they should make a, a social thing of it, uh, the way they do in Europe. That would be a good thing. Uh, you know, Edward Kennedy was for the draft. I mean, you know that that that's a pipe dream now, but that was another example, uh, uh, you know, of an issue. Uh, also, you know, that you could have negative things. I think throwing crooked Wall Streeters in jail and doing something to clamp down on on abuses on Wall Street. It's a social agenda, not just an economic issue. It's not going to change the income distribution that much, but it is going to. Send but I, them don't don't you think the bigger problem you run into is the social issues with the Democrats trying to court the uh, the white working class? Well, there's that too. I mean, yeah. Uh, but we know that they just cling to their guns and their god because you know they bitterly et cling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, no, I I think that's right. I think I think and and, and you know. This is a point that's made by Barney Frank and a bunch of other people, the late Barney Frank. Uh, politically late Barney Frank. Politically late Barney Frank. That's a real loss. That's a real loss. I have to, a, a conservative named Ira Stoll wrote a blog post basically describing all the good things Barney Frank has done. I have to go read it, but that was a... He's one of a kind. A contrarian. Well, he did help drive the economy out of the ditch by supporting Fannie Mae, so, because they employed his boyfriend. There aren't many people who were in positions of power over the last 15 years who didn't weren't wrong on some issue that wound up leading to the economic apocalypse. This is a pretty big issue, and the, you know, I don't know. He's it, it's never it was never clear to me what Barney Frank what his goal was. His goal was just to get more money to poor people, uh, I guess, and it didn't. Uh, well, was, yeah, I mean, I don't know the details. I had assumed it was to open up housing to lower income people. But, but that that seems. I mean, I, I prefer social equality as a goal than just getting more money. You've made people. that very clear, Mickey. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. It, it does, but you know, but he was such a smart guy that it sort of didn't really matter what his goals were. Yeah, uh, and which which became increasingly refreshing. His intelligence as as the average member of Congress got stupider and stupider over the last few decades. Anyway, he points out that a lot of these social issues are distractions from the basic bread and butter issues and, and, and he's right about that. Yeah. You know, and he even opposed like the gay marriage initiative in California for that reason. Mm -hmm. He blamed it for costing the Democrats the you know, one of the elections, I forget which one it was, I think 
uh, I think 2004, maybe. So, Wayne, uh, if, if, if this analysis is right about the new Democratic coalition, then it accentuates the, the fact that, that um, Hispanics are going to be a crucial block in the next presidential well, election, right? It, it, the Democrats are hoping they're a crucial block. We, we don't know exactly how crucial they'll be. It seems to me that uh, they're only crucial if, if the thing is otherwise in equipoise. And, uh, but it is, it, it did become clear to me both, you know, in my quixotic run for office and just, just thinking about things that the, the immigration debate is, is not really all about so much what is the best policy, you know, we, we, we can, we can arrive at to manage the desire of, you know, poor people living abroad to come here balance that with the need to maintain a tight labor market at the bottom in the United States. Right. It's all about a crude ethnic appeal to sure. these voters. And don't you think it's interesting? Uh, don't you that, think it's that's why both parties are pursuing it. That's why Newt Gingrich is right. pursuing and it. That's exactly what teeth, I was going to say. In the teeth of, of opposition among the Republican I mean, primaries. Isn't it's, it fascinating that he feels confident enough of getting the nomination that he's kind of already turning to the general? Uh, whereas, you know, Six weeks ago, he was a total laughing stock, and, and now he's already taking risks like this, right? Well, that's classic Gingrich is to be megalomaniacally overconfident. Uh, remember when he said, okay, we're going to balance the budget by cutting Medicare. Mm -hmm. well, that's, what, that's what caused Clinton to beat him in the, in the budget showdown. Uh, it was an overreach on his part. Now, do you uh, think he can be the nominee, A, and, and B, do you think he can win the general if he can be the nominee? Both are possible. He'd be a disaster. That's why I side with Ann Coulter and think Romney is, is you know, we should just all mm -hmm. settle for Romney. Romney lowers the risks of the country. The country will survive Romney. We know we, Massachusetts survived Romney. He's, he's, he's not going to do anything radically uh, stupid and screw everything up. Gingrich is a, is a much iffier proposition. Whether we survive well, Gingrich. You know, in terms of domestic policy these days, I'm not sure how much a president can get done anyway. Uh, I know, but Gingrich, he'll have all these crazy ideas. He wants a red card plan where basically anybody in the third world can get a red card to come here. So we have to go through the whole months-long process of pointing out to him this is really a terrible idea and nobody's for it. And then he's got these local committees he just brought up that are going to decide which... Illegal immigrants get to stay. I didn't stay. think that was so crazy. It was. It was the point. The point is that everybody knows that if, if the borders are secure, eventually some the people who are here are going to get to stay. I'm in favor of letting them stay in the mm -hmm. shadows and not talking about it until the borders are secure. But because the overriding impulse is to pander to Latinos, they are going to talk about it. They're going to say, "Okay, we're going to give you amnesty." And then the question is, how will this this future amnesty be administered? And, you know, it's, it's, it's not crazy to have a Selective Service-like uh, characterological, uh, you know, uh, sort of sorting out. It probably wouldn't withstand legal attack. It's a weird form of kind of federalism. I mean, because the, the decisions of these boards are going to vary a lot depending on where they are. Right? I mean, it, it, it's... Uh, Right, well, I, and, and it would probably violate the equal protection clause in a whole bunch of different ways. But yeah. uh, it's it's just not a crazy impulse to say the people who know them best get to decide. No, he has crazier impulses. I mean, I you know, of course, worry about foreign policy, and I worry about it with both of them. I mean, uh, almost equally. I mean, Romney, uh, you know, he's fallen into some pretty disturbing hands in terms of his foreign policy advisors. What, I think. what disturbing hands? Because I haven't followed this. Oh, I forget the name. I, I can link to the blog post. I mean, all, well, almost everyone has in a way. You know, it's interesting um, at this debate, at the last debate, which I only saw excerpts of, but, well, there's a couple of issues here. I, I mean, there's a media issue here. I, I mean, uh, an issue about CNN's integrity, right? Because... The debate was sponsored by AEI and Heritage. I'll get back to foreign policy in a second. The, um, but but the, it was sponsored by AEI and Heritage. <clears throat> but it was CNN that, that, that you know, put its good name uh, on the debate. But then the questioners 
were these, you know, uh, these people who, who kind of were kind of quasi, uh, you know, audience members, but were people like Paul Wolfowitz. And who's that crazy woman at AEI? Like, almost literally crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, well, then, you're not subject to the libel laws, Bob. Okay, maybe we shouldn't mention her name. <laughs> but uh, um, the name will come to me. They would stand up and ask these questions that basically on foreign policy that basically kind of framed the entire discussion as as a neoconservative discussion. I mean, both Heritage and AEI are basically... Well, but the candidates can rebel against that if they want. It's well, a, and maybe one, one or two did, but they were, kind of leading, they were kind of leading questions. And I, I don't know. I just... I, my question is this. Did AEI and Heritage, like, in some sense, subsidize CNN in a way that made CNN let the questioners come disproportionately from AEI and, you know, that it's an interesting media ethic. Where is Howie Kurtz? Howie, get on this. I doubt that it was money. I doubt, I doubt that it was money. It was probably more just that AEI got the debate going and, you know, the candidates would show up for AEI. Well, like, the candidates won't show They're up not. for CNN? If you say the debate's going to be on CNN, they won't show up? Come on. There have been other CNN debates. I, I, what do they get out of, I, It's a good question of what they get out of uh partnering with these these think tanks well what they definitely got was like that, people like you know people with a track record of getting us into disastrous wars being the people who framed the foreign policy debate i mean they didn't have to and you're right candidates can say anything they want but they didn't have to be obsessively focused on the iranian threat for example you know let's, let's, uh or they could have asked different questions yeah. about the iranian threat let's let's talk about the iranian threat but because there is a uh, there is a, a an Im, I, impulse that the neocons yeah. are drumming up to 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 uh, to have some military action against Iran, but but first the Bush's Bush's uh, misguided war we've now uh, called over and declared victory, and the war that Obama said we should fought Afghanistan is mired in in you know is turned into a quagmire. So. Wait, what did you? How did you characterize the Iraq War? I say we won war? Bush's war and we're losing Obama's war. You say we won in Iraq? Yes. Have you so, have you been reading at, the papers at all? At the moment, I have been reading the papers. Why? What have I missed? Well, just a series of bombings in Iraq that well, make there's it always going to be very unclear. That, oh, there's always going to be you know. We lose Iraq when a bunch of generals take over and it's not a democracy. So you're anymore. saying it's, it's look, you're saying Iraqis are just going to have to settle for the fact that per capita they're going to have about five nine elevens a year, and that's just life. Of course, when we have one, we have to go blow apart the entire Middle East. But you're saying Iraqis will just have to live with the fact that this is just you know, you, you lose you know that that percentage of your population and you shouldn't be whining about it. You're calling so the, this victory. You're saying for that they get a, a roughly working. Arab democracy in the heart of the Middle East. Well, that's, I think that's what worth it. remains in doubt after all well, right, of the people if that, killed. If that fails, then we will have lost. But at the moment, it's working. Well, actually, uh, there are people who argue that even if it succeeds, you know, you've made you you greatly complicated uh, the pursuit of our interests in the Middle East and various other things by giving Iran uh, leverage and and so on. But. Uh, in, in any event, I mean, I just look, don't look, think it's an I mean, the other thing, Mickey, is, the Iraq war the other thing Mickey is, as the Arab Spring demonstrates, it's quite possible that, you know, you would you would be seeing the stirrings of democracy. Uh, I, I mean, it's quite possible that through or, that organically Iraq could have gotten to a stable democracy before it's going to get to one this way. But um, Iraq was certainly one of the least likely candidates for an Arab Spring, wasn't it? It would have been one of the last to go, uh, probably, yeah. But, I mean, I, I seriously doubt that when you finally got there, the toll would have been nearly as horrific as it's been, not to mention, and this is, for me, the big thing. I mean, first of all, not to mention the money. You've heard of the, you know, the budget crisis. Okay, not to mention the money we spent. Uh, not to mention, you know, 100,000 dead people, at least. Um, and, above all, the big thing for me is... The way this is kept alive, the the threat of homegrown terrorism in America, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars have done so much to aid jihadist recruiters, and we're not out of the woods on that one. I mean, the costs of that war have just been epic and multidimensional, and uh, you know so much so that if you said they were finally going to become a stable democracy tomorrow, 
and asked me, is that worth the cost? I would say, absolutely yeah. not. I knew you were going to say that. Okay, so we interrupt this dialogue to bring it to an end. Um, we wound up talking so long that uh, we decided to turn it into two dialogues, and on the second one to be discussed, uh, to be posted like, I don't know, sometime in the future. We talk about Iran and what else? What do we talk about? Uh, undocumented immigrants. I knew I could count on you to remember that. <laughs> and Joe Paterno. Um, so, boy, is it exciting. And they should stay tuned for that, huh? We got, we got child molesting and uh, euphemism. So, yes. Yeah. And what is a good euphemism for child molesting, Mickey? That's a good one. We can crowdsource that one. <laughs> okay, we'll do that. Um, anything else we should crowdsource? Um, well, this is attached to the first dialogue, and if, if, if they want to give me any suggestions about what my, my show should be called, they can do that. The Moral Animal. Excellent. MoralAnimal.tv. I think I own that, actually. Okay. Just an idea. Okay, and a darn good one. That's why you pay me. That's, I pay you for ideas that good, yes. Okay. See you around. See you next time. Bye. Uh, the next episode. Yeah.